What's up, YouTube? I'm Danielle, and this is Kitchen Optimus. I'm a novice cook, but expert eater, taking on recipes that scare the sugar out of me one teaspoon at a time. One of my favorite store-bought cookies is Pepper's Farm Brussels cookies. They're crisp, they're chocolatey, but not too chocolatey. Sweet, but not too sweet. They're the Goldilocks of cookies. I don't buy them all the time because they're one of my favorite cookies and I have very little self-control, but I recently bought a bag and those Brussels cookies were significantly smaller than the last time I remember eating them. I don't know if it's cost saving. I don't know if it's because they're trying to get their calorie number lower down on the back, but I felt a lot disappointed and a little taken advantage of by a cookie. So what is the solution? Figuring out if I can make them myself or at least a close approximation. I found a recipe on sallysbakingaddiction.com. Easy lace cookies. I'm a big fan of the comment section of any recipes. I think there's great hints and watch outs. A very important one that I saw on this is somebody who had made these cookies on three different surfaces, nonstick aluminum foil, parchment paper, and the baking mats. And this person, this stranger on the internet who I'm trusting with my baking future, said that the only one that worked properly was the silicone baking mat. So because I didn't plan enough to order it online in advance, I spent this morning going to Michael's, Walmart, Target, and finally giving up and just going to Williams-Sonoma where I knew they would have them and that they would be two to three times as costly as at the other places. They did have them and they were expensive. But sometimes success is costly. Most of the prep of this is done on the stove. Her recipe is supposed to yield 30 to 32 cookies or 15 to 16 sandwiches. Since I'm going the sandwich route, I am acting in optimism that these are gonna be good enough for me to want this quantity. And I'm doubling the recipe, which will be below the video in the description, like always. In this morning's silicone baking mat odyssey, I did not bother to check on my dry measuring cups. Now, we have bought two full sets of dry measuring cups. We have melted, apparently, all but one one-third cup and two full cups. Unfortunately, this recipe calls for some halves. So I'm gonna have to weigh my almond flour. I will not be including the kitchen scale in the cost to make this item. So I've gathered my ingredients and I am ready to move over to the stove. Let's go. I just set my heat to low and I'm gonna add a cup of butter. Here's our half a cup of almond flour. One and a third cups of brown sugar packed. Half a teaspoon of salt and two tablespoons corn syrup. Now I'm supposed to whisk this until the ingredients are completely combined. Three to four minutes. She says if the butter starts separating, which it definitely is, to take it off of the heat, turning that off, and whisk vigorously. Oh, okay. I'm not sure that that worked, but maybe when the rest of it melts more. Shit. Does look like my butter is combining better. Maybe all I had to do was sacrifice my whisk to the butter gods. Two teaspoons of vanilla. And now we let this thicken for 10 minutes. I knew we had different size pans, but I did not know the measurements. And I was at Williams-Sonoma, so I got two different sizes. Hopefully, this little one will fit one of those pans. So yes, this fits a 15 by 21 inch pan, and this is a 17.25 by 11 inch pan. I think I'm just gonna do that and hope it all works out. Um, so this one's too big too. Cool, cool, cool. Wonder if that one fits here, but it's too small. Yeah, just not the right dimensions either. So that's extra fun. This one definitely fits this pan better. I wonder if the French have different dimensions of pans because the length doesn't match the width for my sad American pans. We're gonna tim it on this and make it work. First, we have to wash these. Very expensive, incorrectly sized sill pads. The guy at Williams Sonoma told me that when these came out, they won some innovation award, which is cool and all. But my suspicion is that he was just trying to make me feel better about spending $75 on these rando pieces of not plastic. Fits like a glove. We're dropping one scant teaspoon, her words, not mine. 
and then they're supposed to be three inches apart. They're supposed to spread. I feel that they will be spreading a bit unevenly given the fact that we have some dipping towards the center. But hey, that's real life, right? Sometimes your whisk breaks. Sometimes you don't measure your pan. These are definitely not two teaspoons. We're gonna see what happens. Her photos did show her using a regular, like I would eat with this teaspoon. So I don't feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. It feels like these are probably closer to tablespoon size, but she emphatically says they should not be. Well, we might end up with one massive cookie. My bet she'll be delicious. Well, I think we have our answer. <laughs> they are too big and too close together and sort of look like war shock tests. So I'm supposed to let these cool for five whole minutes, which is what I'm gonna do because if I don't follow the direction, something could go terribly wrong. And then I guess we are going to use the inferior parchment paper method and scrap this pad until I get a bigger pan. I guess that's sort of the point of this, right? It's not about doing things perfectly. It's about trying things for the first time. My mom had a quilt book when I was younger. It had different patterns, beautiful photos of the completed quilts. And one of the patterns was called, she did the best she could. And so sometimes you are triumphant and sometimes you did the best you could. They could still be super yummy, even if they're not super aesthetic. We are now transferring these art projects I'm gonna brag, but quite the baker. I think we'll try to cut those apart later. Or maybe just fold it in half and I'll just do one huge one. I'm gonna use significantly less this time. Now that we've learned that lesson, it could be the size, it could be the distance. Yeah, I should move that over. Okay, these I think are a lot closer to what they're supposed to look like. So I'm not really sure what went wrong here. I'm pretty confident that they were in for the same amount of time. Maybe it's cause this batch was thinner than the other ones. This was on the bottom and I'm used to the ones on the bottom being darker, but these are verging on carbonized rather than caramelized. I don't know. If you have any suggestions, I would love to hear them as to why the exact same amount of time would yield such a more campfire smelling result one time over another. Leave it in the comments below to help me out for the next time. Start getting my chocolate prepped. I went with semi-sweet 56% cacao. I don't know why, but my oven has definitely decided we are hot on the bottom right now. I just burned a bunch more. Haven't changed the temperature on the oven. Haven't changed anything that I know of. So that is a mystery. These are very wafery and very, very thin. The next round, all of the bottom row ones came out crispy AF again, and not in the way these cookies are supposed to be, in the burnt way. So I'm now only using the top level, and we'll see if that works. I'm making the executive decision that I'm not gonna put chocolate on these monstrous ones, these guys. I just think it's really likely that they're gonna break, and this process has taken a whole lot longer than I thought it was going to, and I'm getting irritated, and I would like to stop. So I'm gonna stick these in the fridge, I've got one more round to go in and then we'll be almost done. We have arrived at the moment of truth. I have 28 exceedingly burnt ones and they taste burnt. Ooh, like in the bitter way. This is not good. So I got 28 inedible ones, but that's on my oven, not the recipe. It's 16 cookies that should be two cookies. So we're gonna go ahead and count them as 32. So to taste it as just the crisp without the chocolate, it's chewier than I expected. It's good. I mean, it tastes like toffee. So if you like toffee, you will like these. It seems a bit ambitious to call these cookies. They really feel like, if I were at an expensive restaurant and I got a lovely dessert at the end of my meal, it feels like the thing that would be adorning the dessert that was brought to my plate. And something that I'd be like, ooh, this is great. I'm so glad they put this on the dessert. But it does not feel like a dessert in its own. Let's try them with the chocolate. They did set up pretty well. I probably should have left them in longer, but I'm done with this. They taste good. I will eat them. 
I will eat all of them. I will enjoy every bite while I do it. I will not think to myself, wow, these taste like Pepperidge Farm Brussels. Sally'sBakingAddiction.com does not sell them as that, but that's what they look like. They still, even with the chocolate, they don't feel like a complete dessert to me. They feel, again, just like the cherry on top, so to speak. Even though I can't eat them all, I do get a lot more cookies than she said that I was going to. She said up to 32 for one batch of the single cookies. And in my sort of rejects between my burnt and my large mutants, those alone were 60. And then I had another 28 here. I have 10 setting in the fridge. We're at 98. I'm sure that I ate at least two cookies worth of that dough. So let's go ahead and call it an even 100 because that makes me happy. Great, you get a lot of them. Now, because they spread so much, you can't really put that many on a pan. Putting on these teeny tiny little lumps of dough on the pan over and over and over again felt a little bit like death by paper cuts. So I do not think that I will make this recipe again. Not because they're not yummy, but because I don't think the tedium and the aggravation is necessarily worth the outcome. She says 30 minutes. That is clearly for one round of pans in the oven. So unless you have an oven can accommodate all pans, which I do not, even without doubling the recipe, it is going to be longer than 30 minutes. To wit, it took me two hours and 32 minutes and 19 seconds. I don't really think that most of this was me messing up. Oftentimes it is. There's a little machination that needed to happen with the parchment and my silk pads that were too big, but really it was just the rounds of cookies that had to be put in. Let's cut off 30 minutes for the additional rounds of cookies that I did because I did more dough. That's still two hours and two minutes and 19 seconds, which is significantly more than 30 minutes. Cost-wise, the ingredients were $42.98. The equipment was $104.51. I include the prices of every item that is being used because everybody's kitchen is stocked differently. Back to the silicone baking mat though, I am not including that in the price here because I wholeheartedly disagree with the commenter who says these cookies don't work with parchment paper. They work just fine with parchment paper. Do not spend $75 on sill pats to bake these cookies. They're totally fine with parchment paper. That was not my problem. I am so including parchment paper in the cost, not the sill pats. The total cost is $147.49, and two and a half-ish hours. RIP my silicone whisk and my patience is on life support. Yeah. One commenter said though that they are really oily. They're really greasy, buttery. I mean, it makes sense. One of the seven ingredients is butter. They're really, really buttery. They're oily. All in all, tasty. Don't regret it. Won't make it again. We'll still try a new version of it, but it was a long time to spend to essentially end up with the Parmesan crisp of cookies. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you're down $100 from the time you started the recipe, but we tried something new. We came, we saw, we are done with this dish. I'm Danielle, this is Kitchen Optimist, fighting the good fight for mediocre cooks everywhere. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe, and until next time, stay sweet.